Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you to all of you for coming here uh, for a celebration of a very important time in our year. Uh, there are many who think it should not just be a month, but uh, we are pleased that since 1976, every U.S. president has, in fact, uh, affirmed that this is a month to celebrate and recognize the contributions of African Americans uh, to our nation. And so for that, um, I am happy. And I am happy that Cambridge College every year has also uh, taken to heart the importance of us gathering for this kind of celebration. Um, I want to thank especially today our Quality of Work Life Committee, uh, who are they're sponsoring this event, for your work, for your commitment, uh, for hosting this and for making sure again every year that we pause for a moment and have this celebration. And I'd like to uh, name the committee members and ask if you would stand or wave so that others can see you and know who you are and your role that you've played in this. So Loretta Siggers, who is the co-chair of the committee, and Rafet Alananze, who is also one of our co-chairs. Lynette McRae, are you here, Lynette? Okay, Jeff Hogan, Sheila Wright, Dean Wright, thank you. Courtney Griffin. California. Robin Shahid Balat, Robin, are you here? Iram Rashid, Ann Osborne, Amber Corrin, and Dean Papineau. So thank you all for your work, for the work that you do all year to uh, efforts to make the college a, a better place for all of us to work and to help that we assure this balance between our work life and our other parts of our life. I also want to thank, uh, special thanks to Khalil Sadiq, who is standing right here. And uh, I see Khalil in the hallway a lot. Uh, I just have to say this, he's always smiling, uh, always, all, like that, always smiling. And honestly, uh, you just feel such wonderful, positive energy from him. Uh, and he is a threefer. He is currently on staff at Cambridge College, uh, working as an admissions counselor. He's a graduate of Cambridge College, having secured his undergraduate degree here, and he is currently a student at Cambridge College, <laughs> enrolled in our MBA program. So uh, you're stuck with us, and we are stuck with you, and we're happy about all of that. So thank you, and good luck to you, and thank you for bringing our guest here today, uh, who you will hear from shortly, and I'm not going to do an introduction because Khalil will do that, but I just wanted to also acknowledge Dr. Jonathan Jackson, sitting uh, to my left, and also Ms. Savina Martin also. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, we will formally introduce you in a moment, and uh, then we are excited to hear from you and your remarks today. Um, I just want to say something very small, because I wasn't asked to give a speech, uh, and I'm not today's speaker. But uh, just, just something on my head and my heart. I had uh, the honor, the gift of visiting this year uh, the newly opened National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. And this museum was decades in the making. Uh, it was a journey and a, a, a labor of love. Uh, and for Dr. Bunch, who was the director there, and so many others who surrounded him uh, to make that dream become a reality. And uh, when it opened, it was very clear that it was very difficult to get in. The waiting lines and uh, going online to try to get a pass to get in, and uh, I had the good fortune again of, of, of being able to visit while I was in Washington. Uh, the museum takes you on a chronological journey uh, that begins in the 15th century uh, in West Africa and Europe with the slave trade, and it brings you forward all the way to the 21st century in the U.S., and along that journey, which is embodied in different rooms and different floors in the museum, you literally are immersed in that moment and that time in history. And you start by going into the basement, and at the basement, the lowest level of the museum, it's very dark, and it begins with the slave trade. And it's very overwhelming. Uh, I found myself walking through the museum and going from room to room with emotions that were uh, very volatile. Uh, at moments I was smiling and laughing and other times crying and gasping. And uh, what I realized along the way is that what I was experiencing was the uh, appreciation by that immersion of uh, the overwhelming understanding and recognition of the stories of African Americans in this nation, of our historical struggles and the sorrows, but also at the end of it all, by the time I finished my journey through the museum, and it's impossible to see it all, um, 
I reached the end uh, at the exit door and realized that what I felt more than anything was pride uh, and the beauty of the strength and courage of a people to sustain and endure. And it is quite an amazing story, our story. Uh, I also had this overwhelming sense of how much this nation belongs to me. Uh, because in fact, the US story, the story of this country, is the story of African American people and so many others. And so I felt today uh, it was so important to say that and to say that uh, more than ever now, I think we have to hold on to that conv conviction that this is our nation. This nation belongs to us. And the values on which this nation was founded, the stories of our founding fathers, the fact that they rose up against oppression to find and discover a new nation that would support all people and be open to immigrants who helped also to build this country. And I think today as I reflected on this moment, I thought this is more than ever a moment for us to remember that and to, in our hearts and our voices, rise up against bigotry and intolerance, against injustice, and uh, to be a nation that represents what I discovered along the way in that museum, and that is that when people come together with shared values and shared vision, and a belief in justice, and a belief in supporting one another, that unbelievable things are possible. So without uh, going forward, I just want to close with a little poem that I love. It's by Langston Hughes, we all know it. I dream a world um, because I think it's fitting. And then I'll step down and I will let Khalil come up and introduce our speakers. I dream a world where men, where man, no other man will scorn, where love will bless the earth and peace its path adorn. I dream a world where all will know sweet freedom's way, where greed no longer saps the soul nor avarice blights the day. A world I dream where black or white, whatever race you be, will share the bounties of the earth and every man is free. Where wretchedness will hang its head and joy like a pearl attends the needs of all mankind. Of such I dream my world. So I hope we will also keep those words in our hearts uh, as we go through Black History Month as well as the rest of the year. Thank you very much and thank you again to our speakers for being with us today. Thank you, President Jackson, for those words. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Cambridge College Black History event entitled Expressions of an Injured Nation, a conversation about multi-generational trauma in the African-American community. Welcome. I'd like to start by first introducing two remarkable guests, and they happen to be uh, two friends of mine. My first friend is Ms. Savina Martin. Savina so is a Boston native, and she's also a United States uh, veteran of the Army. Savina so has over 25 years of experience engaging in social justice work centered around advocating for female veterans in the area of trauma due to substance or physical abuse, homelessness, or public support services. She's an amazing speaker who has spoken across the country, and her success at helping to organize grassroots campaigns, Savina was awarded the prestigious Dr. Martin Luther King Drummer Major for, Drum Major for Justice Award in 1988. In 1993, she founded the Women's Institute for New Growth and Support, a nonprofit for women recovering from substance abuse that is still providing hope and support for women today. Savina is currently studying to receive her PhD in education and organizational leadership with an emphasis on Christian ministry. She has three wonderful children who live and travel outside the United States of America. Uh, and Savina is also a news junkie and enjoys listening to music. Welcome, Savina. My next friend is Mr. Jonathan Jackson. He's a cognitive neuroscientist investigating behavioral, genetic, neurological, psychological, and cognitive changes as people get older, as well as individuals with Alzheimer's disease. He is currently the director of community outreach and engagement at MGH and is an instructor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. Jonathan, these are his words, is a prolific public speaker on topics related to AD, as well as science, health literacy, clinical trials, 
cognitive neuroscience, and health disparities in the black community. Jonathan has been conducting a series of community forums called Black Lives Matter in Health Two, where he educates the community about healthcare disparities and barriers to, to care. Welcome, Jonathan. To set up this conversation today, I thought it would be fitting to start by watching an amazing video created by a collaboration with the Equal Justice Initiative and the artist Molly Crabapple that was played during one of a series of public conversations created by the Schomburg Institute for Research in Black Culture called the Equity Series, Truth and Reconciliation. This particular event was hosted by Khalil Muhammad, the former director of the Schomburg, and Brian Stevenson, an attorney, social justice activist, author, founder, and director of the Equal Justice Initiative located in Alabama. Mr. Stevenson is currently working on establishing a memorial to peace and justice in Montgomery, which will document nearly 4,000, 4,000 lynchings of black people that took place in this country over 12 states. So without any further ado, I'll play this video. It'll give us the context of the conversation we'll be having, and then we'll move forward from there. In 1619, when the first Africans were brought to the British colonies by ship to Jamestown, Virginia, they held the legal status of servant. But as the region's economic system became increasingly dependent on forced labor, we descended into slavery. The institution of American slavery developed as a permanent, hereditary system centrally tied to race. Millions of black people were forcibly taken from Africa crammed on ships and brought to the Americas through a dangerous and deadly journey that crossed the Atlantic. Millions died. Once on our shores, slavery deprived the enslaved person of any legal rights or autonomy and granted the slave owner complete power over the black men, women, and children legally recognized as property. An ideology of white supremacy, a narrative of racial difference was created to rationalize and justify the continuation of slavery. American slavery was often brutal, barbaric, and violent. In addition to the hardship of forced labor, enslaved people were maimed or killed by slave owners as punishment for working too slowly, visiting a spouse living on another plantation, or even learning to read. Enslaved people were also sexually exploited. The United States Congress finally banned the importation of slaves from Africa in 1808. Slavery was widely considered a gross human rights violation, yet enslavement was retained and persisted. The 1808 declaration caused the demand for slave labor to skyrocket in the Lower South, and the domestic slave trade grew to meet this demand. Between 1808 and 1860, the enslaved population of Alabama grew from less than 40,000 to more than 435,000. Slave traders chained African Americans together in couples and forced them to march hundreds of miles from the Upper South to the Lower South. Steamboats carried slaves along the Alabama River. Rail routes constructed with slave labor brought hundreds of enslaved people to Montgomery, Alabama every day, turning the city into one of the largest slave trading communities in the United States. Enslaved people would be paraded up Commerce Street to slave warehouses and slave depots. The city's slave market was at the Artesian Basin, now known as Court Square. 
Enslaved people of all ages were auctioned along with livestock, standing in line to be inspected. Public posters advertising the sale of slaves included gender, age, skill, complexion, owner's name, and price. Slavery in America traumatized and devastated millions of people. Husbands and wives, parents and children could not protect themselves from being sold away from each other. Enslaved families were separated at an owner's or auctioner's whim, never to see each other again. The domestic slave trade separated nearly half of all enslaved people from their spouses and parents. In 1833, the Alabama legislature banned free black people from residing in the state, meaning that enslavement was the only legally authorized status for African Americans. Even as the Civil War raged, slave trading in Montgomery flourished well into the mid-1860s. After the Confederacy's surrender in 1865, Congress passed the 13th Amendment, which prohibited slavery nationwide except as a punishment for crime. But in many former slave states, slavery did not end. It simply evolved. Southern whites, angry after losing the war, targeted black people who were largely abandoned by the federal government in the 1870s. For decades, black men, women, and children were tortured, terrorized, and killed by mobs and violent lynchings, oppressed by a system of racist laws and customs. For another 100 years, black people were racially segregated, denied the right to vote, education, and basic dignity. They were humiliated, beaten, or killed for minor offenses or for protesting. The civil rights movements of the 1950s and 60s helped to end legally authorized racial segregation, but racial bias still persists. Today, a presumption of guilt is assigned to many people of color who are disproportionately arrested, convicted of crimes, and sent to prison. African Americans are six times more likely to be sentenced to prison for the same crime as a white person. One in three black males born today can expect to spend time in prison during his lifetime. Police violence against black people is so epidemic that civil rights demonstrations have shut down cities across the U.S. as thousands of people march to protest police brutality. Many states celebrate the era of slavery with Confederate holidays and by honoring the defenders and architects of slavery while ignoring the history of enslavement. The Equal Justice Initiative believes that racial bias remains a serious problem and is a direct and lasting legacy of American slavery and our failure to deal with the history of racial injustice. The Equal Justice Initiative seeks to foster an honest conversation about the legacy of slavery, about mass incarceration, and racial inequality, and how it still affects millions of people today. We can confront and overcome bias and discrimination. Please join us in this conversation so that we can move forward together. All right, thank you for that. All right, so let's get right into the conversation. Uh, Dr. Jackson, I'm gonna pose this first question to you. Okay. When it comes to conversations about disparities that exist in the African American community, like social economic status, healthcare, education, it seems to me that multi-generational trauma sits in the background like white noise, intimately connected to all the disparities that exist in the African American community. What institutions are responsible for bridging these conversations that we're having around trauma 
And where should we uh, want these conversations to lead? Is it enough to have a conversation uh, in the public? Should we be talking about how we're going to affect public policy or best practices? So what should we want to get from these type of conversations that we're having today? Um, all right, thanks, Khalil. Uh, so I, I think that's a really interesting and uh, complicated question, as you might imagine. Um, so I, one of the things that I do, and I need to preface my answer with, by saying that I'm, I'm not an activist, or I'm not a historian of, of the black experience or culture. I'm, I'm, I, like, like Khalil said I'm, in, in my introduction, I'm, I'm just a scientist. And so I, I sort of stumbled into this world, and so my, my answer reflects, um, I think, some of that naivete. So I believe that the, the best solutions that we can come for uh, have to come from a place of recognizing the trauma initially. And I, I, this is a process that is still ongoing. So th this video was wonderful, uh, but it didn't, and it didn't actually mention health disparities, which is responsible for claiming more black lives than any of the other things combined. So for example, the, the health disparities in diabetes alone. Diabetes kills more black Americans in a week than the police brutality kills in a year. And that's just diabetes. So, you know, I, I think we need to recognize some of these traumas that are happening. We need to become much more educated uh, about uh, the, the system. And instead of identifying people to blame and pointing the finger, or instead of uh, assuming that the system is too vast and overwhelming to, to penetrate or change, we need to start having specific conversations with specific individuals and specific institutions. Uh, so. For example, uh, I will be uh, part of a community forum, a town hall tomorrow, uh, down in Dudley Square, uh, as part of my Black Lives Matter and Health 2 series. So we're going to have uh, a number of panelists from the community and from the hospital, and uh, we're going to have that conversation. We're going to talk about uh, who is to blame, if that's helpful, but we're actually going to spend a lot more time on solutions. So we're going to define the problem space, which I think is part of the issue that we have. So as we saw in the video, slavery was banned you know, by the passage of the 13th Amendment, but that just gave rise to this whole shadow system of Jim Crow. When we gained civil rights in 1965, it gave rise to this whole shadow society that are, I think are encapsulated by pr police brutality, health disparities, microaggressions, uh, and things of this nature. So we need to start having conversations about what's happening now, instead of uh, seeming grateful for the rights that, that we've gained and, and hoping that those aren't eroded, as we recognize that they, they currently have been um, with recent Supreme Court decisions. Um, so I believe that education is, is really the, the first starting point, and that gives rise to a sense of empowerment and I've seen this in, in my work out in the community as well, is that once you give individuals this information, once they can put a name to the things that have been happening to them, then they can suddenly see it, they can point it out, and they can categorize it. And once you can categorize it, you can say, I have you know, this, you know, you know, like all of these documented instances of, say, microaggressions, or all these documented instances of disparities. And the hope is that you can use that sense of empowerment to lead to action. So, you know, we were talking earlier, Khalil, that, that having a conversation is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Standing up and protesting and, and saying that there are harms that are happening to you is wonderful. But without doing the, the really difficult work, and the work that I think we forget about when we talk about the civil rights movement, we talk about, uh, you know, the way out of Jim Crow in, in the, during the periods of Reconstruction, is the difficult work of having conversations, really tough conversations, about what these harms are and how to overcome them. We forget that the civil rights movement was, was not you know, three men. It was not Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King uh, working together and solving this on their own. It was an enormous coalition uh, that was nationwide. And we need to get back to the roots of that. We need to, we need to rise up as a community, you know, no matter what group that you're affiliated with, and, and say, these are the problems that I recognize. And, offer and receive support from others. So I, I really believe in this model of, of education followed by empowerment and then using that empowerment as a means to action. Um, when it comes to, to, to pointing the finger, 
I think, I think we have to point it at, at pretty much everybody. Everybody in this room, we have to point it at ourselves. Uh, everybody has to be a part of this process. Uh, there's, no, there's, no, there's no sidelines. You know, you can't necessarily say, you know, we see, we recognize this multi-generational trauma. We recognize these inequities, but that's on you to solve. You know, you're the brown person, you need to fix that. Um, I think it would be a grave mistake to say, to see this, to, to know the things that we know, and to say, well, I, I'm, I'm too busy, so somebody else is gonna have to take care of that. I, I truly believe that, uh, and that's, that's kind of how I ended up in this, is, is recognizing uh, the harms that I saw in my research field of Alzheimer's disease, looking around me and seeing everybody say, oh, I'm too busy to deal with this, or you know, my career's at stake. And I, I just said, well, you know, I'm, I'm a smart guy. I'm sure that if they fire me for not doing enough research, then I can get a job somewhere else. So I think it, it is, it is on, incumbent on us to, to recognize that the time is now. You know, we, you know, this is just future history. And if we can recognize that uh, you know, we are, we are gonna be judged by future generations for our action or our inaction, uh, then I, I find that personally uh, very motivating. Excellent, excellent. All right, Savina, so you know, you know, we know each other very well. You're doing a lot of great work on the ground. Talk to me about forums, having forums like this and what we should expect from those forums and what we can do to hold people accountable to make sure that these um, conversations don't fall just dead. Uh, we're witnessing um, expressions in terms of the breakdown uh, in society around um, the topic of healthcare issues, mm -hmm. uh, veteran services, um, war, um, education. So all of those things are at the forefront right now. There should not be one thing that we are not ready to tackle, commit to, or dedicate to. I mean, everybody's here, so we must be dedicated to some form of um, uh, education and or uh, contribution within on the community level.